It's the little things that make a difference on our dairies now because nearly everybody has a decent freestall barn, a decent parlor. Um, whenever the consolidation of the dairies were occurring, it's, they're getting better and better facilities, and now it's the tweaking, it's the tipping point that's making a difference for their success. So it's the little things that improve chances for success and differentiate you from your competition. And in this communications training that I'll be talking about, it's nuances, it's the little things to help you differentiate yourself from your competition. Real quick, I'm going to talk just in general about leading change on dairy farms. Then I'm going to, for those of us that are sequential that need formulas, take you through a formula for change. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're learning around neuroscience and the process of communications and how our brains take in information and process information. And then finally, we'll do some practical applications this afternoon. So by the end, I would like for you to be able to Think about that change equation. Occasionally, sometime in the future, you may need to write it down just to orient yourself, why can't I get this change to occur? I'd like for you to be able to help identify steps to overcome resistance to change, which will be in that equation. By the end, I'd like for you to be more aware of the practical understanding of neuroscience, of understanding how your clients or your teammates or your business leaders take in information and process information and finally, this is not a workshop. Communications workshops is where we really get the job done. This is really about just increasing awareness of what's possible. And if you wanted to take your team or you wanted, if you had clients that you wanted to take um, their, their management team through a workshop, that's where we really get the effective change. But hopefully today we'll increase your self-awareness of our sensory and cognitive preferences and how we as business leaders can work to align with the preferences of the person that we're working with. So it's about understanding yourself and your preferences and then aligning with knowing your client and aligning with his or her preferences. I've been interested in change for many, many years. Um, and this particular quote about leading change really struck me. It's actually from the NIH. Um, and it's, I found it posted at valuegovernance.com. Effective change management enables the transformation of strategy, processes, technology, and people. And we need all of the above to make progressive advances and change over time. All of those four pieces are to enhance performance and ensure continuous improvement over time. Think about that. Tra strategy, processes, technology, and people. And a lot of times we have the best strategy in the world or we have the greatest technology in the world. But until the people adopt it and are able to implement it and apply it to their own situation, it's not that effective. Gordy Jones has been a leader in the dairy industry, in my opinion, in that he's a great storyteller. He's a great storyteller. But more importantly, he's able to establish the strategies, processes, and the technology on the farm to help the people to understand and apply it, right? And I believe that Gordy and others like him and Novus Cows, it's making a difference in how facilities are utilized and how cow comfort is enhanced. And, and that's the difference. We can have the technology, but without the right environment for that technology to work, it's not as effective. So you guys have probably heard lots of presentations about bottlenecks, uh, you may have heard presentations on Dairy Comp 305. Steve Eicher would help you to have you to think about various things. Maybe Gordy Jones has you think about bottlenecks. I'm not going to have you thinking about that. So just get ready. So wake up. I'm glad I'm first because this is not going to be stuff that you're necessarily used to listening to. What I'm going to talk about is the people side, the part that we're most uncomfortable with. So for those of you that are comfortable with formulas, I'd like for you to write this down. Change occurs when D, dissatisfaction, times V, the vision, times F, the first step, are all greater than the resistance to change. So change occurs when dissatisfaction times a vision times the clear first step, that product, product, not addition, product, 
are all greater than the right side of the equation or resistance. Okay, so I want to lose 10 pounds. Okay, I know I need to lose 10 pounds because my clothes aren't fitting right anymore. I'm dissatisfied with my weight. And I have a, a vision that I'm going to look better, I'm going to feel better if I lose weight. And I know, because I've got on my Facebook page all kinds of tips for the day, be able to take that first step to be able to decrease calories and to increase exercise. I still don't do it. So what is it that's causing me to resist that change? So you as a consultant could help me by identifying what my resistors are, or maybe you could help me find that one fun thing that really is a clear first step that causes me to overcome that resistance. Or maybe the doctor comes to me and says, you have to lose weight, such that you're dissatisfied enough that you have to make the change to come overcome your resistance. So this can apply to individuals. It was really designed by Eberhardt and Harris for organizational change. But it applies to dairies, it applies to individuals, it applies to your business teams. So if I know the need for change, I have a clear vision and goals, I have a concrete first step, I have successful change. But what if Mrs. Dairy Producer doesn't really see a need for change? We've been doing this for years. So why do we need to make a change in our feeding program? 28,000 pounds, pretty good. Why would we need to make a change? So without that need, but you have laid out a very great practical plan for them with a clear vision and goals, you have a clear first step as to what to take to be able to get there, but they still resist the change because they don't see the need for the change. Or you may be in a situation where your client sees a need for a change, but can't quite picture the bigger picture as to why we need to make that change that change. And you gave them a clear first step. Oh yeah, I can do that. I can, I can change the order of how I add my feed or I can change my cow flow. But you don't get successful change because you have a lack of coordination. Maybe he didn't see the bigger picture of where you're headed to decrease stocking density. Maybe he didn't see the bigger picture as to why, if he reduces stocking density in that transition group, that he's going to have higher milk production, improved reproduction, improved hoof health. Maybe he can't see that bigger picture. So instead of working on that pin, he decided to go ahead and make another change, because you said you just want to make a change, and he pushed up feed more often, which may be a good change, <laughs> but it's a lack of coordination for the bigger change that you wanted to make, right? Maybe he sees a need for change, you have a clear vision, shared goal, but you just haven't been able to help him to take that first step. And sometimes this is the hardest one, to have a very clear, actionable step that he can take. So you can apply this change equation anytime you're working with a group of people or an individual client. And sometimes it's useful to step back before you get to the client and just sit down and go, what is it? How do, how do I know what his resistance is? How do I know what the vision is? A lot of times we don't know because we don't ask. But sometimes we do know, we know in our gut, and so we can kind of orient ourselves, okay, I know that I can help decrease his resistance by lowering the cost. I just made that up. Or I know really what he needs is to have his son in the room with him so they can do a future plan to see the bigger picture, to create that vision and goals. So just a little change equation for you to consider. Now, the most important part of change, though, is being able to communicate to effectively get change to occur within people. Because we can have successful change equations, we can have strategies, processes, and technology, but until we can get communicate with the people, to build the rapport and the trust for them to trust you enough to make a change, we're not gonna have successful change. So let's shift more to the, the neuroscience side of things. Um, so there is an online tool um, that you can participate in that's called Brain Pathways. It's um, a self-assessment instrument online, which once you go through the 20-minute the online exam, it'll help you to determine how you prefer to take in information, whether or not you're mostly auditory, visual, or kinesthetic. 
It'll also help you determine uh, how you process information. Are you more sequential or more global? Why does that matter? Have you ever seen a sequential person in a business planning meeting talking to a global person that can only see the big picture? Have any of you ever seen two people talking where you've got the big picture person over here going like, wait, no, we can't go down to, we can't fill the spreadsheet out yet. We've got to see the big picture. Anybody ever experienced that? Yeah. And just being aware of that and just understanding that will help us to make a difference. So slow down. In your brain, you might go, oh, yeah, you're global. Well, we've got to wait a minute. We've got to bring the global along or vice versa. So this is an awareness process. This tool will help you to do that. New Identity is the group that both my, uh, Dr. Miller and I work with a lot. And we conducted these uh, surveys with farmers, crop farmers, dairy farmers, veterinarians, nutritionists, and I'll show you some of that data um, in just a moment. So this information, this workshop, um, actually goes along with a workbook, The Practical Neuroscience of Leadership, that we put together. It's actually a leader's or manager's handbook to work through if you're coaching people or if you're coaching teams. Um, and it helps you to assess the output of that tool. How do you like to be taught new information? How do you like to think about new information? And how do you like to teach other people? What's your preferred way of being taught new information? Sitting on your butt in a conference room? Yes, I don't believe in. How many of you prefer to learn information by sitting here watching slides? You prefer that? Uh-oh, Novus, we got a problem. <laughs> what would you prefer? Being out on the farm doing learning? Yes, no, yes, you'd rather prefer. So ironically, our school system trains us to sit still and be still and listen. That's how we're trained. But our bodies are not necessarily wired to do so. <laughs> In order to be an effective communicator with another person, we need to appreciate if they need to do it, see it, or hear it. Just be sensitive to how they want to take in information. Do they want to do, be doing it, or visualize it, or hear it? And then the other piece is, are they a planner? Or are they one that, oh, I need to understand the bigger picture first. Being aware of this in yourself first, and then connecting and aligning with your client if you're global and he's sequential, appreciating and respecting the difference and then working to align your communication to meet his need is where we're headed. So there's three primary sensory modes in the brain. Uh, there's auditory, which is where people prefer to hear information first. They prefer to take in information. They listen to, to MP3s. They listen to CDs, books on tape. They love NPR type radio talk shows or whatever radio talk show you want to listen to. They take in information in that way and they're usually really good students in college because they're taking in information, they're taking notes and they can get it. The visual, and by the way, about 8 to 10 percent of the population prefers auditory. Yet our teaching system is set up for that traditionally. Okay? Now, those that prefer sensory-wise to take in information visually, they prefer to see it. And if they're teaching, they prefer to show it. I'll show you a graph. I'll show you a slide. I'll show you a picture, if that's how you like to bring in information. About 30 to 40 percent of the population is highly visual. And so for those of you that are visual, you prefer to bring in information by looking at it. The fact that I have antenna sticking up from each side of my neck is probably very bothersome from you. I mean, it could be that every time I turn around, you're like, God, what is that stuff on her back? Because you get really distracted by things that you see when you're highly visual, when you prefer to process information that's visual. Kinesthetic. Majority of the population, about 50 to 60 percent of the population is highly kinesthetic. All of us take in information all three ways, but we have a preference. About 50 to 6% of the population prefer to learn by doing, acting on. 
And one of the things that the psychology studies are seeing now is our use of iPads and iPhones are actually helping these kinesthetic folks because they're busy, they're doing, they're using their hands. Now, how effective is it? I don't know, but it's, it meets their need to do, right? So these are the three primary sensory modes um, that to be aware of to be able to connect on the communication perspective. I'm special in that I'm in the 8 to 10 percent. I'm highly auditory. It's rare, and a lot of people have been frustrated with me throughout my career because I need to talk about it. I didn't know at the time that I needed to talk about it because of <laughs> that's how I process information. But I need to hear it. I want to talk about it. I want to discuss it. I do hum. I do talk to myself. Uh, words are really important to me. You know, the context network, I was attracted to the context network because the word context. I'm like, oh, that's what we need in agriculture is nobody understands the context, what it takes to be able to produce food. Words are important to me, and maybe to some of you too. Those that are high auditory prefer to listen. They ask a lot of questions. They love to tell stories. And when they get frustrated, they're inside going, don't you hear what I'm saying? Can't you hear what I'm saying? Have you ever met anyone that you think is high auditory? Does anybody know Dr. Mike Lormore? He's high auditory. He and I and Martha Baker were the three auditories in all of Monsanto Dairy. And we drove people crazy because we were always wanting to discuss it, wanting to talk about it. But this is the exception rather than the rule. Let's move to what more of the population's sensory um, mode is. Most of us are highly visual. We want to see the data. We want to see the information. In airports, we watch people. We're always seeing colors. We're catching the details of what's going on around us. We like to visualize standing in the future. Attractive surroundings are important to us. How we dress and whether or not it matches is important to us. My husband is a tucker, and he has to have that shirt tucked in just perfectly all the time. He cannot get beyond. He cannot wear this shirt out like is the style today. He's a tucker. And it's very important that it's perfectly matched and straight and tucked in. It's, he's highly visual. So it's just interesting the little things that you start seeing about yourself when you learn what your learning style is. A lot of people who are highly visual are taking notes. They'll take notes or they'll doodle. Or if they're trying to maintain their attention, they're doing something with their hands uh, to draw a picture. Graphs, data, are really important to this, this particular learner. And when they're frustrated, they tend to say, oh, why can't they see what I'm seeing? I mean, they literally use those words. Why can't, why, why can't you see what I'm seeing? Or in their mind going, he's got to see this. But even the language starts showing up um, in our, and demonstrate our preferences. Majority of the population prefers to bring in information kinesthetically. So if we're thinking about making change on a dairy where a majority of our dairy clients are highly kinesthetic, we need to figure out ways that we can be moving around, talking, demonstrating, showing, actually getting out with the cows, touching the cows, walking the feed bunk, getting out, being active. These folks love to build and repair things. They like flexibility. Don't box them in a room and force them to sit in a seat for eight hours. They need flexibility. Love hands-on. They tend to dress for comfort. They want direct experience to really understand. So until I see the change in my bulk tank, I'm not sure about that additional four pounds of milk or eight, seven pounds of milk that you're talking about. They want to experience it, not just see it on a, on a chart. So there are three primary preferences. It sounds right. Is it auditory? And I, say, I catch myself saying that a lot. Oh, that sounds right. It looks right or it feels right. So if you're interacting with someone that's highly visual and you say it sounds right, 
you probably won't connect with them as well as you would if, you, if they're highly visual and you say, do you see that? Does that look right? And I know you think this is hogwash, but there's actually true psychology. There's true different kind of science from what we were trained in, but true science behind connecting with someone based off of their or mirroring their style, their pattern, including their cognitive and sensory styles. So let's look at the data. Uh, first, let me orient you to the chart. So this is, on the right, the, the, the first bar for each of these three areas of auditory visual kinesthetic are the Young Dairy Leaders Institute from class nine. The third bar over is from class eight. We have 375 farmers in this database. Most of them are crop farmers. About a third of them are dairy farmers. Um, we have a large Wisconsin dairy that we recently um, conducted the brain pathways with. Um, that's the purple line, which is the fourth bar. General group of, of consumers, we have nearly 4,000 of those in there. So that's just your general consumer that's purchasing milk. We have veterinarians and PhDs uh, that are the gold color, which is the fifth bar. Nonprofit organization is the blue bar. CTU, Colorado Technical University faculty, they're online teachers, by the way. They're online teachers. Is the peach bar and then marketing team. And this was an agricultural marketing team that's, that's uh, green. So what's the first thing, thing you notice about this? You guys look at data. What does it show to you? Mr. King? All pretty much the same to me. He says it all looks pretty much the same to him. I see some big differences from the right side of the chart to the left. A lot of consumers. Uh, if you were to identify, exactly, we've taken, uh, more consumers have taken the test than agricultural people. But if you were to identify what's the primary preference of how these people take in information, would it be auditory? Visual or kinesthetic? Kinesthetic, clearly kinesthetic, yeah. That's true particularly for the ag people. So this is Young Dairy Leaders Institute, farmers, Young Dairy Leaders Institute, Wisconsin Dairy, all of their employees, and then consumer, which is the average consumer. And look at the CTU faculty who teach online, not as kinesthetic, but ironically, they're very visual. So people are attracted to their preference in a career if they really fit within their career. That's why you guys are probably primarily kinesthetic visual or visual kinesthetic, because you like to be out on the dairy with the cows or with your laptop on the desk with the producer. You like to be active. The other interesting thing, the nonprofit. And I actually, as an undergrad, interned I just needed the money, but I interned in the development office for the University of Kentucky, which is a not, it, it was working with not-for-profits to be able to line up money, and so I got a sense for not-for-profits. And when I looked at this data, I'm like, maybe that influenced me to be more auditory, because those people did a lot of talking. But anyway, I think for you, even though your clients may not have taken the exam, you can pretty much bet that they're highly kinesthetic visual, likely. And if you know that, then you're going to get the best change response from them if you're doing and showing, versus, hey, how you doing? Let's talk about this, which is a lot of times what we do. Um, here's another data set. Again, um, this time it's de the normative data is the total population, so it's about 3,000. We have a group of farmers, the Wisconsin dairy, I pull back in here. Then we look at male owners in orange, which is the fourth bar, and female owners in green, which is the one, two, three, sixth bar. So what do you notice about the difference between the male owners of dairies and the female owners of dairies? Women like to talk more. Women like to talk more, yeah. We have a lot more words to use in the day than you guys do. And we need to use them. <laughs> Come on, and we will use them. That's right, Dale. That's right. So a little bit more. That, yeah, that's true. But what do you see from uh, the majority of how they like to process information? Kinesthetic. Yeah. 
um, they, they could have worked in an office where their job is to talk if they really were strong and auditory. Uh, but they like to run dairies, right? So they're kinesthetic. So the other aspect, not only of how we bring in information, but how we process information is the cognitive aspect of whether we process information sequentially or globally. Those that prefer to process information sequentially are very organized, logical, approach things with the data. They have to have data to be able to be convinced. Global people are the bigger picture people, the visionary, broader goals. They're multitaskers. They're also, this exam also identifies integrated. And for me, my result was integrated leaning global. I like to think bigger picture, but in 25 to 30 years of business, I've learned I need to be integrated to be able to connect with my business leads. So here are the cognitive preferences for the same population. The dairy population primarily sequential, needing things orderly, needing to see the data, or do they want to talk about the big picture? They want to see the data. They're sequential. Yeah, they want to see the data. It's particularly these young dairy leaders, um, highly sequential, which I found very interesting. And then the veterinarians, which is the blue, again, highly sequ sequential. We do have some veterinarians that are also global, but what was interesting about that, those global veterinarians are working for companies and they're leading strategy sessions. They're bigger picture people. They're not the on-farm palpating cow veterinarians that are the global. So it's just interesting how we're drawn um, to our preferences. And again, here's the data pulling out the, the male and female, and I've changed the order on you. The female this time is the second bar, and the male this time is the green bar. So the women who are running dairies are those that are highly sequential. And if you're going to be selling to a woman that's running a dairy, you need to have your data, you need to have your facts. A man as well, but I'm just saying these data reinforce that need for sequentialness. On the other hand, as we've collected more data, and we're starting to look at more and more large farms, those that own 3,000 cows or more, more and more of those owners of those dairies, which happen to be men, are global. Now, why would that be? Because they're thinking about the bigger picture of building another dairy. They're the kind of people that want to get into the role to build another dairy. And they expect you to be able to come in and think bigger than adding Mintrex, as an example. So thinking about what your style is, what your um, client style is, and where you want to help them to grow, to change, to share that vision together, understanding their preferences will help. So everybody has their own unique brain mode preferences. There's no combination that's better than the other. You can leverage, strengthen, and balance your brain modes. We do have neuroplasticity. We can change. But our innate preferences are, uh, as I described, primarily kinesthetic for many of you. For me, it's auditory. And when I'm afraid or stressed, I become more auditory, and I'll become more articulate in what I'm saying. I didn't realize that, but all of a sudden, I learned that, yeah, when I get stressed, I find that I talk a little more like, and that's my auditory coming out. And when you're stressed, you want to be doing things. Gosh, why can't we just do it? Why can't we just jump in and do it if you're highly kinesthetic? So when we're stressed, we tend to lean on the uh, preference as well, but in a different way. So adapting to others' preferred modes develops excellent rapport. So does your way of communicating to your clients and the clients that you want to acquire to help them to build that next dairy, does your way of communicating match up with their sensory mode and their cognitive mode, the way they want to receive information? If it doesn't, hopefully the awareness from today will help you to start thinking about, I can't overcome his resistance. Maybe it's how I'm approaching it. Because personality-wise, I'm different than what he is. I have a different preference for how I take in information or process information than he does. So how can I adopt to start thinking more globally if that's what he is and how I approach him? 
So keep it in mind, if you have someone that's highly auditory, auditory, they need to hear progress reports, they need quietness, they don't like to be interrupted. Those that prefer visual, uh, have visual preference, need to see the progress reports, need to see the information, pull it up on your computer, have them to look at the actual data or print off graphs. Dairy Comp was great for um, those highly visual learners in the dairy industry because we can look at a graph and look at how much we can tell from a graph today from Dairy Comp. Um, and finally, kinesthetic needs, they need demonstration, action, hands-on, face-to-face, um, physical comfort in uh, unconfined movement. You'll often find that if a person's highly kinesthetic and they're talking on their cell phone in their office, they're talking just like this, okay? Because they got to move around. They got to move this energy out. They got to move this energy out. So just asking you to be more aware of that and try to match up with your client's needs. I wanted to highlight that I believe the, the dairy, the Novus Cows assessment, which I'm looking forward to getting the updates there, is a great example of pulling in highly kinesthetic needs on the farm at the cows, right? Getting in there, getting the farmer involved, along with pictures. I've seen pictures that you've left on the wall, along with being sure that you're meeting the auditory needs as well. So I think a great example of pulling all that together. One quick thing I want to highlight, our sensory preferences almost disappear when we're under stress. And I want to talk about neurocognitively why when we're under severe stress. When we're under severe stress, as Dr. Paul McLean uh, described the triune brain is what he called it, we tend to revert back to the reptilian mode of our brain. Get back to protection, fight, flight when we're under stress. The limbic system, as he describes it, is where we process information. And the neocortex is where we're able to make decisions and where we're able to have fun. And thinking about when, we're, when you have a client in a reptilian stage, he's under a lot of stress, milk prices have dropped, he's highly leveraged, it's hard to get him engaged, it's hard to uh, keep him from getting angry, and it's hard to converse with him. We want to be able to move him into the limbic system of his brain, that midsection of the brain, where we can get a little more in touch with why his emotions are that way. And finally, where we want our clients to be is to trust us enough to always be comfortable with us, be willing to have fun with us, be willing to laugh and talk with us, because when we're in that portion of our brain, we can actually think. We can actually think and collaborate. So how do we move from reptilian to the limbic system? If you're in that situation, first thing you do when he snaps at you is breathe. Take the time to stop, pause, and breathe rather than snapping back. Taking a breath also brings oxygen to help us to get, start moving beyond our reptilian system. Start asking a few questions to clarify that are empathetic type questions to be able to get him to calm and breathe with you. Eventually draw a picture, potentially, if he's a visual, draw a picture of, let's see, let's take a look at what are the pieces here that are most concerning. And then finally, if you can laugh about it, you can get him back into his neocortex so you can get back to, to thinking more about getting a decision made. So some fun things to learn about the brain, some fun things to learn about communication. Takeaway, strategies, processes, and technologies are all really important. And I'd love to see even more innovation in the dairy industry, and particularly as it comes to technologies and processes. Communications that motivate the people aspect to implement change continues to be the toughest to accomplish. In our workshop, we also do additional training around types of questions to ask to be able to calm people down, types of questions to ask to be able to uncover additional information clarification type questions. And finally, just understanding and being aware of how we take in information, our sensory mode, and how we process information, our cognitive mode, sequential or global, can provide a competitive advantage for you in a speed to sustainable change. And being able to address whether or not it's resistance to change you need to lower, or whether or not you help, need to help your client see a clearer vision, or a clear first step, or 
help him to move out of his dissatisfaction. If you think about that change equation, it's our ability to communicate with him to be able to implement that change to overcome resistance. So based off of what you've seen and heard, what do you think your cognitive preferences are? Are you primarily kinesthetic? Raise your hand. Let's get kinesthetic about it. Let's get involved. Two kinesthetics, three kinesthetics. Visual, a lot of visuals, yeah. And auditory, a couple of us are auditory, yeah. What's interesting is it's the combination. So I'm auditory, kinesthetic, visual, and I'm one of those that really talks and walks. Have you noticed that? Because I need to walk out my energy. I talk and walk, and I need to do things. I can talk about it, but then I'm ready to get in there and do it. So if you choose to go into the uh, online assessment, you'll learn even more about yourself so that you can relate to your clients even better. So that's what I have. I'd be glad to entertain any questions. I'm not sure how we are on time. So my question is easy. Um, when you had all those things broken out as dairy farmers, were farmers grain farmers? Or was that agriculture farmers? It's a combination. The farmer, the total farmer bucket was a combination of crop farmers as well as animal ag, okay. yes. And then I tried to pull out specifically dairy farmers, and then I pulled out that one large dairy uh, from Wisconsin to kind of give you a sense for um, how they're processing information. And it was that large dairy where we really rec started to recognize that the top guy and his son that was going to be the predecessor do not have the same learning styles. And we've been working with that. And we've made a difference. I was, I was in the session last Wednesday. We've made a difference. But the other thing we learned was that the top guy was very global. I mean, he's like big picture. He's ready to franchise his restaurant in addition to building three or other dairies, you know. So um, it was just very interesting. And some people that he's hired in are a little more global. Then he hired a very sequential guy as his chief financial officer. You know, so he really was thinking about, um, because we've been working on this for a few years, he really was intentionally thinking about how to line out his team to meet these learning styles. Does that help? Yep, thanks. Yeah. Other questions? Jeff. So I'm curious, um, in thinking about all the producers that we know and work with that seem to be comfortable with the status quo. Mm -hmm. okay? And I always wonder with that, with that group of people, um, are, are, they, are they kind of stuck where they're at because that's um, it's just innate? in them, so they're, they're just happy with the status quo, or do you think it's maybe more that they are not surrounded with good counsel and helping, you know, with people that can help them kind of move their business forward, right? So yeah. you know, you've got this category of people that just seem to always move, so it may be a little bit more of a DNA thing, but the great majority of producers kind of don't fall into that category, right? And so I wonder, is it, is it us? In, in not being effective consultants, or is it just more them and that's how they are and that's not gonna ever change? Well, that's a really interesting question. Is it us or is it them? And I guess I contend it doesn't matter. <laughs> because, and the reason I say that is, if you're committed to be able to help that producer, whether he wants to change or not, if you're committed to help to understand what are his drivers, what is his vision, what is a clear first step that he could implement to overcome his resistance, then even though he's complacent, if you're committed to making that difference and continuing to sell him or influence him, you'll work to find what that tipping point is to get him to consider change. A person that's completely complacent is a lot of times the hardest one because they're not dissatisfied. It's those that are dissatisfied or see the big opportunity. I actually like to change Everhart's equation. I'm an optimist. Instead of the D, I use an O for opportunity. But um, they tend to be, I think, the hardest. Uh, but it's thinking about each of those factors and how it contributes to his resistance to change. And if you just get one of the three factors right, it's not enough because it's the product of those three factors 
that are greater than the resistance to change. So even though you have a perfect clear first step for him to change his order, or change the milking order or whatever it is to help speed through, even though that's clear, it may not fix his problem because it wasn't the area that was the most greatest opportunity and it wasn't aligned with the bigger vision of where you're trying to help him. So I think it's both of us. It's not us or them, it's both of us. But I think the onus is on us as a service industry to be able to uncover and help him to articulate and help him to uncover and see what his opportunities are. And you guys do a great job of that. I mean, I, I know a lot of you and I know that's what you do on the farm and that's what you enjoy the most on the farm. Long answer, apologize, but I think it's both of us. So the group of clients where we might say, geez, he, he or she is just never going to change, mm -hmm. we probably shouldn't accept that, right? That they, they will under the right circumstances and with the right counsel. Right? Yeah, it, it's a good question. Um, do you ever give up on a client, I think is your question. Well, yeah, sure. And uh, the answer is yes, if you have another alternative. You know, and there are other alternatives. Um, but you, you, you know, in business, we want to get those that are most likely to adapt to change. And once you get that level, though, we're going to be left with those that absolutely won't change. How do we, over time, get them to the point that they will change? And maybe it's by influencing the next generation that's going to be on that dairy. That's what's frustrating about change to me is time. It takes so much time. Yes, Lindsay. How long would um, doing that online assessment take? It takes about 20 minutes, yeah. And if you want to do the online assessment with a team, uh, there's a package that we can set up with a group of people. There would be a cost associated with it, but you would also get the, the full workbook and manager's handbook. And that way, you as a team can look on the charts as to Oh, that's why Jennifer's always asking all these questions. She's highly auditory. And that's why everybody's so kinesthetic. They, they want to be out working with the cow so much, I can't get them to do the spreadsheets, to do the visual part. So it's just an awareness thing. But being aware of that, then you can start shifting and working with that individual, be helping to facilitate, what would be an easy way to get him to do that spreadsheet, to do his paperwork? So we do a lot of team building and team training around that. Um, we just did a big strategic planning session um, last week with another large dairy in Wisconsin with their leadership team. And they, uh, a month before, had done their brain, brain mode assessment. And it was very interesting to listen to the language and that there was one auditory in the group, and she said, I know you can't hear what I'm saying, but let me show you what I'm talking about. It was just so funny, but it really made an impact because they were really aware of each other's um, modes of taking in information and processing information. Other questions? Great questions. Yes? You mentioned stress and emotions affect decision making and whatnot. We've all remember 2009 and I see that pattern sometimes again like right now we've got this little downturn and, and how do you break that cycle of stress decisions or you know it seems like some of the dairies that made those decisions in 09 are making those same decisions mm -hmm. now. and I'm a hopeless optimist and I always you know it's always going to get better and there's a future in dairy and whatnot, and it seems like some guys just make your head gets long when you're trying to convey that to them. And I've tried some different approaches, but how do you, is there a way to break that cycle? Or, I mean, that's a huge challenge. Yeah, it is. And every individual is different, right? And so I think that's what this testing does for us. Although, in general, we have KVAs, kinesthetic visual. The individuals are different and their percentage of K and V is different. So that individual, there's probably different drivers as to why he's repeating the same problem again. Um, but that's what's key is understanding the driver. It's harder to understand it under stress because they live in their reptilian 
I, I don't have time, I can't talk, I just, I, you know. Um, but anything fun can temporarily bring people out of that. Music can bring me out of it, but I'm highly auditory, right? But getting him out walking the cows sometimes will at least get him to have the conversation and talk. Uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. To visualize what, in, in our language, is to visualize what's in that neocortex. So visualize those positives that you've already done. Exactly. Look at the progress we've already made. You know, so being able to bring that through helps to highlight thinking in that part of the brain. Yeah. So I don't have a, a set answer for you. If I did, I wouldn't be doing this. I'd be making a lot more money. But, uh, but yeah, but I really do think it comes down to the individual. And I think we're to the point in the dairy industry today where it is down to the individual. If you look at the number of farms, that farm owners that we're dealing with now versus even 10 years ago, um, we can afford to start taking some time to understand the nuances of the psychology of the individual to be able to get them to the tipping point that they're interested in listening to us. There's hope. <laughs> There's definitely hope. And it's the small changes at a time, right, that make the difference. And as you're listening to the next series of presentations, I'd like to ask, if you would, um, to be thinking about some of your dairies of what would need to change for them to be able to apply or execute what um, Kevin or Will is talking about? And what are some creative ways that you can get them to start thinking about it differently from a kinesthetic and a visual perspective? And at the end, we're going to uh, talk about that a little bit more. We're going to experience some of that. Okay? Thank you again.